Good morning. 2016 has been a truly remarkable year, and it's one for the record books. During 2016, we saw incredible wins. We saw some tragic losses. We saw curses that were broken. We saw our country get some well-needed hugs. We also saw a change in our leadership. Oh, sorry, wrong slide. There we go. <laughs> but 2016 was also a remarkable year for literature, especially critical care literature, which is my passion. And in the handout that I sent out, and if you didn't get it, don't worry. There's a link at the end where you can download it. I put for you the 16 articles that I thought were the best of the best from 2016. And within that handout, I've summarized it, I put the high points, the low points, the things that you need to know from that. And we're going to go through a few of those articles today during this talk. Now, we're not going to be able to get through all 16, but again, it's all in your handout. And I don't want to just pepper you with facts from the literature. I want to give this in a case-based format to put it in a perspective that you can take to your next shift and take care of your sick patients. So let's get to our first case. This is a 55-year-old guy with hypertension who's found down at home by his family unresponsive. His vomiting, he's not moving his, his right side. Paramedics are called, they bring him to you. You evaluate him in the bay. His blood pressure is 220 over 120, his tachy to 110, his afebrile, he's not really talking much, he's vomiting, and everyone in the news room knows what's going on. He's got to bleed. So you do the things that need to be done for patients who come in with, with bleed. You get the head of the bed elevated. You get him on oxygen. You avoid hypotension. All the things that Dr. Slovis talked about. You avoid hyperthermia. You avoid hyperglycemia. Head of the bed elevated promotes ICP drainage. So you lower the pressure there. You're doing all the right things. But you need to get him to CT scanner. And you know this guy's not going to make it without his airway secured. But you got this. You get all the stuff to the bedside. You get apneic oxygenation going, you get your tube ready, you push the meds, and here we go. And as you take a look, this guy is more difficult than you gave him credit for. He's a bit more anterior. You try adjusting his larynx a little bit, you're not getting it on the first pass. So you put the mask back on, you try bagging him up, but his sats are dropping. And you know hypoxemia is so important, so you're really freaking out here. And eventually you get the tube, but unfortunately, his sats have dropped to low 80s, high 70s. Again, you feel terrible about this because hypoxemia is so important for our patients who have presumed brain injury and confirmed brain injury. So let's talk about a better way to approach this airway. Now, from the anesthesia literature and patients who are morbidly obese, it's been shown that elevating the head of the bed 90, uh, 30 degrees, aligning the ear of the sternal notch, is a much better approach for patients who are being electively intubated. It improves the airway access, it reduce, reduces aspiration, it improves pulmonary dynamics. But the real question is, would this help you in emergent airways? Does this positioning help your patients get better first pass success? So the study we're gonna look at was a study of 528 patients, and this was a retrospective review, done by anesthesiologists, but outside the operating room setting. So these were all emergent intubations, then outside the OR, done by anesthesiologists. And what they were looking at to see was the rate of um, different outcomes based on the angle of the bed. So some patients were intubated at zero degrees, some patients with the head of the bed elevated to 30. And the primary tool for the initial part of the intubations was direct laryngoscopy. When they, the things they were looking for were the rates of difficult intubation as rated by the anesthesiologists, the rate of esophageal intubations, how many aspirations there were, and how much hypoxemia they had found. And here's what they found in their retrospective review. One in four patients who were intubated in the supine position had at least one of those complications, as compared to 9% of patients who had the head of the bed elevated 30 degrees. So elevating the head of the bed in patients who need to be emergently intubated can reduce some of those complications, and maybe we could have done better by our patient by intubating him upright. I know what you're saying. Slow down, buddy. 
This is not our population of patients. These were inpatients. Yeah, I know they're emergent, emergently intubated, but they're not emergency room patients. And those were anesthesiologists. We're not anesthesiologists. We're better. We do things differently. So for you, I have a different paper. And this study just came out in January. And this was done in two academic emergency departments in the States. And what they did in this study was they had a period before the study started where they trained residents on how to intubate patients at a variety of different angles of the head of the bed, up to 45 degrees. And then they started their study and they let them loose. And they said, go ahead and intubate patients knowing this newfound skill. And they let the residents decide what they want to do. They had 231 intubations, spread up about 60 residents. They were looking as their primary outcome at the rate of first pass success. They had a bunch of secondary outcomes as well, but I think one of the more important ones was the rate of cardiac arrest that happened within 30 minutes. You know what they found? They found a higher rate of first pass success when patients' head of the bed was elevated 45 degrees. And they also found less cardiac arrest for those patients within 30 minutes. So in an emergency room setting that was prospectively done, elevating the head of the bed appears to be beneficial. In fact, when they looked at the data and did more statistical analysis, analysis, they found for every five degrees you elevated the head of the bed, there was an 11% chance that you get first pass success. So here's my takeaway point. I like to train my residents and fellows how to intubate with the head of the bed elevated. But if you're not there yet, then I suggest when you do your first pass, you can't get it, do something different on your next attempt. We always talk about changing your blade or changing the position of the neck. Try elevating the head of the bed and see if that doesn't improve your success. This is something I think you should try in your next shift. So you get that tube in and the respiratory therapist says to you, all right, doc, what tidal volume do you want for your patient? And you look at the guy and he's a little bit overweight, maybe even obese. And so the question becomes, how are you gonna determine your tidal volume? Well, you recall that when you're prescribing a tidal volume, it's based on only two factors. It's based on your height, it's based on your gender. No matter how wide a patient gets, their lungs are always the same size in adults. So we always prescribe six to eight cc's across the board. But the question becomes, what happens when we have patients that are obese? What happens in real world practice, even though we know we should be doing six to eight cc's of ideal body weight? Well, this study sought to address that question. And what they did was they looked back at 517 patients who were ventilated in the emergency departments and they recorded their BMIs. And they were looking at the tidal volumes they got as a function of their BMI. And what they found in the study is that overall, for all the patients in this review, 20% of patients, one in five patients, got an incorrect tidal volume. Not 68 cc's per kg, somewhere in the range of 10 cc's per kg. Way more tidal volume than our patients should be getting. And when they further looked at the data, they found that the more overweight you are and the more obese you are, the higher the odds that you're going to get an incorrect tidal volume. Now, I gotta tell you, this was a single center study and you can pick that apart, but in my own practice, when I take care of patients, and not just in the emergency department, even up in the ICU, this is something we can be doing better. Now, I don't want you to go home and memorize the formula for ideal body weight. Don't bother. Get MD Calc or one of the pocket apps. You can even have laminated cards and some of the respiratory therapists already have this. Just get a good tape measure for your patients, measure their heights, and check out their gender. So our patient now is ventilated with the appropriate tidal volume and is off to CT scan. And he comes back, and it's exactly what you thought, an intracerebral bleed. So the next step, you've elevated the head of the bed, you've given good oxygen, no hypotension, you're gonna get on the phone with your friendly neurosurgeon. So your neurosurgeon goes through all the things, but you got it. You elevated the head of the bed. You gave him oxygen. You did all the right things. He asks you what the INR is. You say 1.6. He says give FFP, and you wish there's a way you can eye roll over the phone. But it is what it is. But then the neurosurgeon asks, is the patient on aspirin? And in fact, our patient is on aspirin. And he says to give the patient platelets. And this will be the focus of the next study we'll look at. This is the patch trial from last year. What they did in this study was they took patients who had an acute intracerebral bleed and were on an antiplatelet agent in the previous seven days, and that could be aspirin, it can be clopidogrel or diperidomol, and they randomized them to receive platelets or no platelets. 
what they had was 97 patients who received platelets and 93 who did not. And they were looking at the rate of death or disability at three months. Here's what they found. That the rate of death and disability was higher in patients who received platelets with their spontaneous intracerebral bleed as compared to, that, to those who did not. They found no difference in the size of the hematoma between the two groups, whether someone got platelets or not. And they found a non-significant trend towards adverse events in patients who received blood products. Now, on one hand, this is a very surprising finding because you think if you're on aspirin, you're irreversibly re reducing your platelet function. But on the other hand, it kind of makes sense because we know that when we give patients platelets, it's a transfusion of product and it causes all sorts of microcircular dysfunction and inf inflammation within the body. So we want to withhold blood products whenever possible. And this is another further bit of evidence to withhold on our patients with bleeds. And the guy, some of the guidelines have already picked this up. And I would talk to people at your hospital, your neurosurgeons, your intensivists, to see if they've picked up this practice as well. So we go back to our patient. We didn't give him platelets. And his blood pressure is 179, 159 over 97. And now you ask yourself, is this blood pressure too high? What is the optimal blood pressure for people with intracerebral bleeds? I gotta tell you, it seems like it changes with the moon cycle on what the appropriate blood pressure is for a patient. It changes from doctor to doctor upstairs. So there was a trial a couple of years ago called the INTERACT-2 trial. And what they looked at this trial was intense control for people with acute spontaneous intracerebral bleeds. And they said, one group is going to have a blood pressure of 110 systolic to 139, and the other group is going to be more liberal, 140 to 179. And they were looking at the rates of outcome. Now, this study, without going into the details, was a little bit controversial. It's controversial on one hand because patients in, in the groups got different blood pressure medications. Some people got hydralazine, some people got labetalol, some people got nicardipine. It was all over the place. So it's hard to form a firm conclusion with so many people getting different blood pressure medications. Another controversial conclusion was that there was no difference between the groups, and they concluded it was safer to keep your blood pressure lower. They did some funky analysis about statistical outcomes. I'm not going to go into the details of that, but suffice it to say, someone else had to do a study to address this. And that's where the ATTACH-2 trial came in. What they did in this study was they essentially did the same study, that's the INTERACT-2 trial, with a narrow control of blood pressure, one group with 110 to 139, and another group with blood pressures of 140, 179 systolic. And they used nicardipine for all their patients as the primary blood pressure medication. They'd use labetalol if they needed more, but the primary medication was nicardipine in all groups. So they randomized patients to type blood pressure control or liberal control, and they were looking at death and disability. You know what they found? They found no difference, and the trial had to be stopped early. There were no difference between the groups in their death or disability. There was no difference in the size of the hematoma between the groups. And when looking at renal function, they found slightly higher incidence of renal dysfunction in the patients with the more intense control. So where does this leave us? Well, I suggest you go back to your hospital and you talk to your intensivist to see what their practices are because I don't think we have a firm answer just yet. I think we can agree that if your patient has hypertension at baseline, then it might be okay to let your patient's blood pressure drift up. Not too high, not above 180, but let them drift up to where they are. And if your patient is normotensive, normally, and now they are hypertensive, then maybe bring their blood pressure control lower. Every hospital has, a, um, has an intensivist, and the thought here is that it'd be a good idea to get your hospital together and talk about a policy that you can implement so everyone is on the same page. So we let this patient's blood pressure drift up because he has a history of hypertension, and he's still with you in the ED. You can't get this guy upstairs. So you do what any good ED doc does. You try to do more, right? So you look at this guy's saturation. is setting at 100%. That's pretty good. But... His FiO2 on the vent is also 100%. And you know you need to titrate it down. If you look at studies from post-cardiac arrest, it's been shown that having lower FiO2s are better for patients. It helps with microcirculatory dysfunction and ultimately end organ dysfunction. We know about all the free radicals that we hear about. But what is the optimal FiO2 for patients? How much is too much? And that's what the next trial that we'll look at sought to examine.
And this is the oxygen ICU trial from last year. And what they wanted to do in all comers to an ICU who are going to be there for 72 hours or more, they sought to see which FiO2 level would be appropriate. This was done in Modena, Italy. This was the region that had that major earthquake a couple years ago. And they randomized patients to have a liberal or conservative oxygenation. So the people in the liberal group, they would say 97 to 100, their PaO2 can go up to 150. And in the conservative group, they kept the, the SATs between 94 and 98, and they kept their PaO2 anywhere between 70 and 100. And what they were looking at was the rate of mortality. What they found in their study is that patients who had more liberal FiO2s, their SATs going 97 to 100, the PaO2s higher, had a higher rate of mortality as compared to people with tighter control. There was a higher rate of shock in patients who had a more liberal oxygen, more bacteremia, more liver failure. So the takeaway message from this is that get your patients' FiO2s lower when you see them. If you talk to many intensivists, they'll tell you that they'll be okay with a SAT of 88 to 90 percent. That's all the body needs. And sometimes we do extra things like increasing PEEP and doing all sorts of maneuvers to try and get the SATs all the way up. And maybe those maneuvers that we do to make those numbers perfect are harming our patients. So just something to keep in mind. So let's bring this case home and talk about some of the high points that we discussed. Any patient who you're going to intubate, not just the morbidly obese patient, but any patient, you should consider elevating the head 30 to 45 degrees. It improves the airway accesses, it improves pulmonary function, and reduces some of those complications during intubation that we talked about. Your tidal volume is always going to be your height and your gender, 6 to 8 cc's per kg. Be cognizant of your patients who have a higher BMI, because if you're not prescribing your tidal volumes, there's a good chance that a therapist is maybe putting those tidal volumes too high. So be sure you go back to that bedside and double check those tidal volumes. Someone with acute intracerebral bleed and they're on aspirin, uh, clopidogrel, or dipyrinamol, you don't need to give them aspirin. The only caveat to that is someone who's going to go for an acute intervention. So if your neuros neurosurgeon says, well, I'm going to put a monitor to them or I'm going to do a craniectomy, those patients should get platelets. So these are surgical patients. But if you're just monitoring those patients, no surgical intervention, platelets cause a worse outcome. Blood pressure goals, no difference between a tight and liberal control. If you know what the patient has at baseline, then go with it. If not, then try to find a hospital policy that helps you out. And then watch your FiO2s. Too much FiO2 can be toxic for our patients. All right, let's talk about our second case. And this is a case of a nurse practitioner who's working in your emergency department. And she has not been feeling well all day long. Just has felt dizzy, lightheaded, but persists on and keeps working. And then all of a sudden, you hear a thump from the room and it's your nurse practitioner. She's collapsed on the floor. CPR has begun on that nurse practitioner because she's pulseless. She's gotten to a resus bay. Advanced airway equipment is at the bedside. And now the question you have to ask yourself, she just collapsed. Are you going to tube her or are you not going to tube her? Not. Did I hear not? All right. Well, there's two things to think about here. There's good aspects of intubating patients, right? Oxygen is good. CO2 is bad. But most importantly, I would like to know what the end tidal CO2 is as I'm doing my resuscitation. It's an important piece of information that I need to resuscitate. On the other hand, as you just heard from Dr. Slovis, it takes the focus away from the things that are important for our patients. Pushing on the chest, defibrillation, not to mention things we don't mention. We like to think that we bag nice and slow with small tidal volumes, but we don't. And if it's not us bagging, someone else is. You bag too fast. And that increases intrathoracic pressure, decreases coronary filling. We bag too much, too much tidal volume, fills up the chest, and doesn't allow the heart to fill with blood. And it goes against us during cardiac arrest. So it's the seesaw effect. We're not sure what to do. So this was a study from JAMA in January, and this was a pretty big trial. This was 108,000 patients that they reviewed their charts. This is a huge database of over 600 hospitals in the U.S. And they were looking at cardiac arrests. And what they did was they looked at patients who were intubated, which was 70% of that population. And within those patients who were intubated, they looked at the patients who were intubated within the first 15 minutes, which was about 95% of those patients. So again, they looked at the patients who were intubated. They looked at the patients who weren't intubated. 
And what they did over those 15 minutes was they matched them minute by minute to see what happened to them, and they followed them out. Their primary outcome was survival to hospital discharge. Their secondary outcome was the rate of return to spontaneous circulation, and another secondary outcome was their CPC scores. How neurologically intact were they when they left the hospital? And what they found is that the survival to discharge was lower in patients who were intubated. Patients who were intubated within 15 minutes had a lower survival as compared to people who were not. Patients who were intubated had a lower rate of return to spontaneous circulation, and patients who were intubated had lower neurologic outcomes. When they did a subgroup analysis and took shockable by non-shockable rhythms, this is obvious, but what they found is that patients with shockable rhythm had worse outcomes when they were intubated. So what does that mean? That means we have to focus on the important things, as Dr. Slova said. You've got to push on the chest. You've got to push hard and push good. Defibrillate when necessary. Give them the medications if you feel like it's indicated. But this takes away an important point when you think about it. What are we going to do about that thing about end tidal CO2? Well, I think this is an article we're going to be discussing more in the next couple months, possibly a couple years. But the way I reconcile it is I'll put in an LMA. Because I make the argument that maybe, maybe it's the act of intubation, time away from chest compressions, that hurts these people. If I can just put an LMA and ventilate that person using slow breaths and low tidal volumes, I can still get that information about end tidal CO2. So we'll hear more from this article in the months to come, but just be aware of it. You're going to be hearing a lot about it. Well, the decision was made to intubate the patient because the airway cart was there. She just fell down. She looked like an easy airway. So someone said, we, we can just intubate her. So the next study we'll look at focuses on the question, if you're going to intubate a patient, should you use direct laryngoscopy or should you be using video laryngoscopy for your patients specifically who are in cardiac arrest? So this study looked at emergency medicine patients who came in in cardiac arrest, and they looked at experienced providers. They define experience as more than 50 intubations under their belt. So experienced providers were doing these tubes. All patients had cardiac arrest, and they randomized patients to get video laryngoscopy or direct laryngoscopy. There were 71 patients who got video laryngoscopy, and 69 got direct. And what they were looking to find as their primary outcome was the success rate of intubations. Their secondary outcome was the amount of the number of interruptions to CPR to facilitate passage of that tube. And another secondary outcome was the period of no flow, meaning that period beyond 10 seconds where people weren't pushing on the chest, again, to facilitate an intubation. Here's what they found. There was no difference between direct or video laryngoscopy for getting the tube in. No difference. Either one was just fine in terms of success. But for patients who were intubated with direct laryngoscopy, there was more interruption of CPR more times where CPR had to be stopped to get that tube in with direct laryngoscopy. And there was more time where the hands weren't pushing down on the chest for direct laryngoscopy as compared to video laryngoscopy. So for me, what that means is that I'm using video for my intubations during CPR. And this is something I was doing before because I can let the person push on the chest as hard as they can, and I feel like I can get a much better look at that person's airway. And if nothing else, when the person stops doing the compressions, I'm at least lined up to take a look and pass the tube. Personally, I like to do a bougie because I can pass the bougie in during CPR, but whatever your practice is, just remember that direct laryngoscopy has been associated with these things. Our patient gets the tube, and now it's time for a rhythm check. And here's what we see on the monitor. We see electrical activity, but you can't feel a pulse. Now here's the problem with pulse checks. There's no way of knowing whether or not your patient has true PEA, cardiac standstill with electrical activity, or your patient has pseudo-PEA, where either the heart is not strong enough to generate a pulse, or, let's face it, we just can't feel a pulse. And there's been data that shows that healthcare providers are not so awesome at detecting pulses. But just based on your fingers and the monitor, you're not able to tell which is which. So let me ask you all, how many of you are using ultrasound during every cardiac arrest? That's fantastic. It's so good to hear. But you have to admit, while it's a practice that makes complete sense, there's not a lot of evidence that tells us that that's a helpful practice. Again, it makes sense. Why wouldn't you do it? 
But we don't have the data that tells us, good firm data that tells us this is a good practice. And so entered the reason trial by Gaspar and his colleagues last year. Now this was a really big multi-center trial. And what they looked here at was uh, survival using ultrasound or predicting survival based on ultrasound. And they looked at the ability of ultrasound to predict who you should terminate resuscitation on. So they had about 800 patients in this multi-center study. No patients were entered who were um, in uh, shockable rhythm. So no one in VTAC, no one in VFib. These were only PEA and asystole. They had 400 patients who were PEA. They had 379 who were asystole. And they did ultrasounds on all these patients. And they were just recording information. 225 patients who had PEA actually had cardiac activity. They were pseudo-PEA. And 189 were cardiac standstill. Of the 379 who were flatline, 38 people had some motion on their ultrasound, and the rest were pure standstill. So when you do the math on these numbers, one in two patients who are PEA actually have activity underneath. And patients who are asystole, 10% have some cardiac activity. Now, it might not be regulated contracting activity, but it's some. Let's look at the data a different way. Let's just look at people who are just standstill, so irrespective of their rhythm. This was about 67. Two-thirds of the patients in the study had standstill when they came in the hospital. Looking at that information, 14% of those had return of spontaneous circulation. Survival of the hospital discharge, 0.6%. Now, we don't know how those patients were neurologically intact, but 0.6, less than 1% of people who had standstill on their ultrasound, left the hospital. The other third of the patients, those that had cardiac activity on their ultrasound, 50% of those people had return of spontaneous circulation. 4% of people survived to hospital discharge. Again, we don't know what their neurodata was. So what does this tell me? If I have somebody with a lot of core morbidities and they come in and they have cardiac standstill, that's it. I'm done. I have a, there's a pretty good chance that they're not going to survive, less than 1%. And if that person comes in, they're young, they have no comorbidities, and they have cardiac activity, I'm going to work as hard as I can for that person. Because 4% is not a big number, but it's not an insignificant number. Four in hundred patients will live. And as you expect with an ultrasound study, they found lots of other cool stuff. They found 15 patients in their study who had a massive PE. All 15 got TPA. One survived to hospital discharge. They found... 34 patients who had tamponade. 13 of those people got pericarditis and two survived the hospital discharge. So you can find reversible causes on your ultrasound. Just another reason we should be using ultrasound on every single code. Now listen, if you're not one of those people who raised your hands, I'm not going to single you out. Don't sweat it. We're not talking about doing a cardiology level echo. We're talking about putting the probe on someone's chest or go subxiphoid and just look for something. If you do that, you're two steps ahead of where you were before. So give it a try. Our patient happened to have a massive tamponade. She got tapped and got return of spontaneous circulation, but unfortunately she went up to the ICU and died a few days later. So let's bring this case back to a close and talk about the things we discussed. Patients who are in cardiac arrest, there is good evidence that intubating our patients in the first 15 minutes is associated with a worse outcome. And if you're going to tube a patient, think about using video laryngoscopy as your first pass so that you're not stopping compression in the chest and you're not decreasing the amount of no flow in that patient. And then finally, for every cardiac arrest that you have, except if they're shockable rhythms, use ultrasound as your primary diagnostic tool. Let's talk about our last case. And this is a gentleman who's well known to you, usually comes in for alcohol, a lunch tray, and then goes home. But this time it's a little bit different. He's found by the paramedics on the ground and is brought in. His blood pressure when he arrives is 100 over 60. His pulse is 110. He's altered. His SAT's 93. His, he has a 100 uh, degree temperature. And you're asking the question, does this guy have sepsis? Before we get to what he has, we'll talk about some new updates to the sepsis definition. Now, for those of you who don't know who this man is, this is Mervyn Singer. He is a brilliant intensivist from the UK. He is a gifted speaker. Some people say he is arguably the best mustache in critical care, and I agree. But the reason to know Mervyn Singer 
is because he's one of the lead authors on sepsis 3, or sepsis 3.0 as some people call it. And this was the first major update to the definition of sepsis in almost 20 years. And let's just go through what that new definition is. The new definition of sepsis is life-threatening organ dysfunction secondary to a dysregulated host response to confirmed or suspected infection. So again, it is a life-threatening organ dysfunction that is secondary to a dysregulated host response to confirmed or suspected infection. So now you get this patient in front of you, how are you going to know if there's any organ dysfunction? Well, the authors of sepsis 3 said, to do that, you're going to use a SOFA score. And these are all the components of the SOFA score. And if you look over them closely, you'll see that some of them require blood, some of them require an ABG. And ain't nobody got time for that when you're seeing a patient when they come in. You need to quickly assess what's going on with your patient. And the authors of sepsis 3 address that. They suggest that you can use a QSOFA or a quick SOFA score when those patients come in. And the QSOFA score is based on three things. The first thing is you need hypotension, which is defined as a systolic blood pressure of 100 or less. Altered mental status is defined as a GCS of less than or equal to 13, or tachypnea, greater than or equal to 22. If you have two or three of these things, your mortality is significantly higher. And that's how you're going to get your patients who have organ dysfunction. So that's one end of the spectrum. On the other end of the spectrum, we have septic shock. Septic shock's new definition is hypotension despite adequate volume resuscitation, and adequate's not really defined, but adequate volume resuscitation that is requiring the use of vasopressors and a lactate of greater than two. So you need two things. You need to be on a vasopressor to get your MAP to 65, and you have, a, have to lap, and you need a lactate of greater than two. Now I know what some of you are thinking. Something is missing here. Though that's the new definition of sepsis. What are the things like SIRS? Where is severe sepsis? Well, the sepsis three group said those things are no more. <laughs> SIRS is gone. SIRS misses one in eight patients who have organ dysfunction, so we're no longer using it. And if you, if you know much about sepsis and the previous definition, severe sepsis has now replaced the de is now the new definition of what sepsis is. Infection plus SIRS is just a really bad infection now. Sepsis is now what severe sepsis used to be. Now, many emergency physicians were frankly pissed off by these new definitions, not because they weren't good or they couldn't be validated, because they weren't included in the discussion. When they brought together the authors of sepsis 3, there were no emergency medicine physicians on the team. Now, in a subsequent interview, Mervyn Singer admits that might have been an oversight, and in future iterations, promises to have emergency medicine physicians um, included in the group. But this definition has been um, adopted by several guidelines, and I think it's a really good one because it helps us to unify these definitions together. So we're all talking the same language when we talk to different specialties and we talk across guidelines. Well, speaking of guidelines, the Surviving Sepsis Guideline recently updated their, um, their new campaign for 2016. And Phil Dellinger here, who's one of the lead authors and also one of my new bosses at Cooper, was one of the, um, was one of the people who contributed. The Surviving Sepsis Guideline has now adopted the sepsis 3.0 definition of sepsis, life-threatening organ dysfunction, dysregular host response. They didn't really weigh in too much on SIRS versus SOFA. They just kind of left the definition as it is. In terms of fluids, they recommended 30 cc's per kg of crystalloid within the first three hours. There's a small mention of albumin, um, a very nonspecific recommendation with weak evidence, but it's there. And they recommend getting good cultures when you first meet your patient. But what they recommend is that if it's going to take you a long time to get blood cultures, well, just go ahead and give them antibiotics. Try to get your cultures, but don't delay giving the person antibiotics if it's going to take more than an hour to get those um, antibiotics on board. Well, what about the Rivers Protocol, early goal-directed therapy? The Surviving Sepsis Guidelines has now stepped away from early goal-directed ther directed therapy. They're not recommending it as a primary force in your resuscitation. They didn't say you couldn't use it, but they're not recommending it. And it's nice to see that they're adopting things from the process trial, the promise and rise data into their guidelines.
They've also stepped away from using invasive monitors, things like CVP to determine whether or not someone needs volume. Instead, they recommend using dynamic monitors, things like passive leg raise. And we'll get to that in just a moment. With respect to vasopressors, norepinephrine is still at the top of the food chain. Dopamine moves even further down on the list. You can consider adding a second line agent like vasopressin if you're on super high doses of norepinephrine, or you can consider adding epinephrine as a second line agent if you're having trouble getting your MAP up to 65 using norepinephrine alone. And then finally, comment on steroids. Not much change here. You could use steroids when the person is in vasopressor and fluid refractory shock. So our patient gets an x-ray. He's got pneumonia. His pressure's getting a little soft. So we keep giving him fluid boluses. But the question we have to turn to next is he got his 30 cc's per kg. We're doing an ultrasound. And we're seeing an LV that's working OK and an IVC that's kind of filled. What's our next step? Now, for those of you ultrasound gurus out there, I'm not about to bash ultrasound. I love ultrasound. I think it's great. But I got to tell you that when it comes to monitoring fluid status, just looking at the IVC in isolation, just looking at the LV and the RV, just as, a, just as a bird's eye view, is not enough to tell you whether or not someone is going to respond to volume. We need a more objective measure. Now, you can use ultrasound to calculate the stroke volume, but it's also not the easiest thing to do. So we can do something like the passive leg raise. The passive leg raise, for those of you who don't know, is a way that we can assess the patient to see whether or not they're going to respond to fluids without giving them extra volume. You see, the problem with too much fluid is that it builds up in the interstitial fluids, uh, interstitial tissues. Too much fluid increases morbidity and mortality. And we don't want to give our patients any more fluid than they need. We want to use it like a drug. Give them what they need and don't give them any more. There's a lot of harm with excess fluids. So this test allows us to determine whether or not someone would respond to a fluid bolus without giving them a fluid bolus. And what we do is we assess what the person's stroke volume is. So we need a way to assess their stroke volume. We get a number. And then we put their legs up in the air. And what this does is it gives the patient their own intrinsic fluid bolus with blood from the lower extremities and the pelvic veins. And that goes back into their central circulation. And if that person increases their stroke volume by more than 10 to 15%, that tells you that that person would respond to exogenous fluids. So go ahead and give them fluids. But if that person didn't respond to a passive leg raise, if their stroke volume did not increase 10 to 15%, then why would you give them an excess fluid load, switch to a different therapy, give them vasopressors, or give them ionotropes if their heart's not working so well? And again, to do, sh to do passive leg raise, you need an objective way of calculating out what the person's stroke volume is. Because looking at the pulse, looking at the blood pressure, is not an effective way of determining whether or not the person has responded. So the next study we're going to look at was a meta-analysis and systematic review of the passive leg raise. Now, the passive leg raise has been validated in lots of small studies, but they're all small studies. So what this did was took all those fluid challenges, all those passive leg raises, and, ran, and put them together and pooled them, and they found 1,034 passive leg raises. They had some means of assessing flow, of assessing the stroke volume. Ultrasound was one of them by calculating out the stroke volume. And they had three other ways that are ways that are used up in the ICU that I won't bore you with. And what they were looking off as their cutoff was a change in 15% in your stroke volume. So again, if you do the passive leg raise, your stroke volume increases by 15%. That tells you, good, give that person extra fluids. And if they don't increase their stroke volume by 15%, don't give them fluids. There's no need. All that fluid is just going to build up into third space and harm that patient. And here's what they found. When you do a passive leg raise, it is 92% specific for someone who is volume responsive. It has a sensitivity of 86%. And for your statistical geeks out there, it has a 0.95 area under the receiver operating curve. And that's really good for a test. So the passive leg raise is something that we should be doing before just giving that person the next liter of fluid. Now, I know what you're saying. Well, slow down there, Haney. I know that doing that stroke volume calculation, it's not so easy. I have morbidly obese patients in my emergency department. I have patients who are ventilated. I can't roll them to the side. I can't get these detailed measurements. So that doesn't matter for me. You told me I can't use blood pressure and, um, and tachycardia as a sign. Well, there is something that we have at the bedside that can help us to determine passive leg raise, and that's the end tidal CO2. 
Entile CO2 is a great way to monitor people's respirations, but it's also a good way to assess their cardiac output. Because you recall, if you increase someone's cardiac output, you're pushing more of the CO2 that's in the blood to the lungs and more gets ventilated out, so your CO2, entile CO2 will go up. And if you drop somebody's entile uh, cardiac output, less blood is getting to the lungs, there's less of a rise in entile CO2. And you can do the same thing with the passive leg raise. Now, this study's from a couple years ago, but I think it's worth mentioning. Take your patient's entidal CO2 at baseline, and then raise their legs up 45 degrees, and if you see a change in your entidal by more than 5% of an increase, this suggests that your person is volume responsive. Go ahead and give them volume. So here's an easy, objective way that you have at your bedside to determine whether or not someone would respond to fluids. The next question we'll ask is about steroids. Is there any difference when you have somebody who is septic to decrease progression to shock? And this was the HYPERS trial. What they did in this trial was they looked at patients who had sepsis. Now, technically what they looked at in their study was severe sepsis, the progression from severe sepsis to shock, but this is before the definitions changed. So I'll just say sepsis from here on. They're looking for the change in sepsis to septic shock. They randomized patients, 190 in each group, to get steroids in our known doses of 200 milligrams per day in divided doses versus placebo. And what they were looking to see was the rate of progression to septic shock, and there was no difference between the two groups. They looked at secondary outcome of mortality, and there was no difference between the groups. They looked to see their length of stay in the hospital and the ICU, and there was no difference between the groups. And they looked at the difference of SOFA scores, no difference between the groups. In fact, the only difference that they found between the two groups is more hyperglycemia in the steroid group, and a little bit of delirium reduction in the steroid group, but that's what they found. So we don't need to give our patients with sepsis steroids. Well, our patient wasn't doing well, starting to have um, a lot of work of breathing, and the decision was made to intubate him. And we're not going to go through resuscitative sequence intubation, where we should be cognizant of the drugs that we use, although I think it's very important. But needless to say, his blood pressure tanked on us. And now we're freaking out. We're squeezing fluids in, we're trying to find lines, and the nurse tells you that that's the only line you got, a little dinky 22 in the hand. Sure, maybe you should have checked out before tubing him, but it is what it is. Luckily, one of your rock star nurses gets an ultrasound guideline above the elbow, and now you have a line. The question becomes, do you want to start using peripheral vasopressors to get this person's blood pressure up? So there have been a lot of studies on this in the past couple of years, and here's another little bit of evidence that hopefully will take people who are still not convinced about it and get them to use it on their next shift. What they did in this single center ICU was they had 202 patients, and what they were looking at specifically in this study was the rate of extravasation for people that were getting vasopressors. And they did not have a protocol. Other studies you may have read in some of your hospitals might have a protocol that when you have extravasation, get some phentolamine or some nitroglycerin paste to vasodilate the area. They had no protocol in this study. They just would be like, huh, extravasation. Hmm. They take out the IV, they put a warm compress, but that was it. they had a 4% extravasation rate in their study, a really low number. The, aver- the median time to extravasation was when the IV was left in for 21 hours, and 50% of the extravasations were norepinephrine. 75% of the patients who had extravasation had a 20 gauge or smaller. 100% of these people were treated conservatively, just with warm compresses and taking the IV out. And no one lost their limb, no one got skin grafts, everyone did just fine. And you want to hear the nerve of the people in this ICU? For the people that had extravasation, 88% of them, they took the IV out, and they put another IV in somewhere else and just went on with it. And those patients did just fine. Now, you could look at this one study and rightly so say, Haney, that's a pretty crappy study. You want me to change my practice based on that? And I agree with you. This is not the best study, the standalone study, say peripheral vasopressors is what we should be doing. But this study with all the other studies that we've seen come up, including prospective studies that you see in your handout, have shown the peripheral vasopressors are extremely safe. It's not perfect, but extremely safe. But here's the counter argument to not using peripheral vasopressors. How many of us have patients who stay hypotensive in the ED for hours and hours and hours, where we keep giving them fluids in the hopes that they're gonna pop up their blood pressure, and then finally after four or five hours, you're like, fine, I'll just put in the central line and give them pressors. And then you put them on two of norepinephrine, and their blood pressure pops right up. How many have had that? 
It happens all the time because sometimes all our patients need is just a little bit of vasopressor to increase arterial tone. And don't forget that your vasopressors not only increase your arterial pressure, they increase your venous pressure, venoconstrictive effects that will push blood that's just hanging out doing nothing in your legs and your pelvic veins and bring it back into your central circulation. And that is, in essence, a fluid bolus by getting more of the person's intrinsic blood back in the circulation. So I look at it as, why aren't we using peripheral vasopressors? Not as a long-term solution. If you have a person who's requiring higher doses or is on the peripheral vasopressors for a long time, get a central line in. But it's safe for 6 to 12, some studies say up to 24 hours. And that, if you have a patient that's in your department for that amount of time, get them on peripheral vasopressors. So let me just summarize this case and say that we have new a new definition for sepsis. The surviving sepsis guidelines have updated their guidelines to incorporate this definition and tweak some of their other recommendations along the way. If you're going to give a fluid challenge, think about an objective way to do it. Passive leg raise seems to be one of the best tests to do that. And then finally, if you have someone who's hypotensive, consider giving your patient peripheral vasopressors. I hope that what we talked about was practical information that you'll take to your very next shift and use to help your patients. I have the uh, link to the handout over here. I'll leave it up here just so you can scribble it down. Please download it and please email me if you have any questions or need anything at all. I want to thank you all for your attention today and I hope you have a great conference. Thank you.